Early in your career, you likely learned how to use a mechanical gauge like this one to test an engine's compression pressure. If you found a problem, though, the follow-up tests were often bulky and time-consuming, to say the least. Wouldn't it be neat if there was an easier way to do the same thing and more? Well, there is, and that's the topic for this edition of The Trainer. Pressure transducers, mated with a modern digital storage oscilloscope, allows us to take the idea of a traditional compression test much, much further. By substituting a pressure transducer in place of that mechanical pressure gauge, we can now trace a pattern on the scope showing the entire 720 degree cycle of a modern four-stroke engine and monitor the pressure changes during that entire time frame. And I think you'll find that the learning curve isn't quite as steep as you might think it is. Even to a somewhat trained eye, the use of in-cylinder pressure testing can help identify cam timing issues, ignition timing issues, uh, mechanical pressure losses and their causes, and a lot, lot more. Let's take a look and see what you need to get started. First, you'll need a digital storage oscilloscope. Some, like the one I'm using today, are PC-based, while others are handheld. And some may already even be an included option on your shop scan tool like the four-channel scope built into this snap-on Virus. Second, you'll need a pressure transducer. The transducer is different from a pressure sensor in that its voltage output is proportional to the actual pressure being measured. There are several brands available and nearly all of them can be adapted to nearly any scope platform. Using the pressure transducer is pretty similar to using your mechanical gauge to perform a traditional compression test. Install the pressure transducer into the cylinder in place of the spark plug and be sure to ground the plug wire or coil to avoid damage to the ignition system. To avoid washing the cylinder down with fuel while we're performing these tests, it's a good idea to disable the fuel system. In this case, just simply by disconnecting the fuel injector. While not entirely necessary, you can add a second channel and use it to add an ignition capture to the screen. This will allow you to quickly confirm whether or not ignition timing is correct. If you're using a transducer specifically designed for your scope, then check the drop-down menus. Odds are there's a setting there that will automatically set up the scope's vertical divisions for that particular transducer for you. If not, if you're using a transducer, generic transducer on your scope, you'll need to look at the manufacturer's spec sheet to see what the voltage to PSI scale is. Once you have that set, set the time base on your scope for a two second sweep across the screen. I'll explain why in a moment. To take full advantage of this diagnostic technique, you're going to perform a cranking pressure test, a running pressure test, and a snap throttle pressure test. But in the interest of time, we're going to perform just the running pressure test and cover the benefits or a few of the benefits associated with that particular test. Now that our scope is all set up and ready, all we need to do is start the engine. If you're diagnosing a general drivability problem on a V6 or V8, you'll want to perform this test on both banks. If you've identified a specific problem cylinder, or you're looking for the cause of a specific cylinder misfire, of course you'll want to test that specific hole. The first thing you should look at is the consistency of the peaks. These peaks are top dead center on the cylinder's compression stroke and should remain relatively equal. Varying peaks means varying compression pressure and significant changes may indicate that something is not sealing when it should and an engine mechanical problem exists. Let's take a look at the actual waveforms that we captured on this 2007 Toyota Corolla equipped with a 1.8 four-cylinder engine. Uh, this was taken on the number one cylinder and the first thing I want to do is take a closer look at one individual 720 degree cycle. So on this particular scope I'm going to use the zoom function to narrow that out. So we'll just open up one 
see when that's opened it up now I get it a little bit more so I can focus just on one 720 degree cycle now here's what you're looking at this is peak to peak and the peak let's first talk about that the peak that you see here is peak cylinder pressure top dead center of the engine's compression stroke one key point I want to make here there is no ignition event we are not igniting any air fuel mixture in the cylinder this is strictly a record of the pressure variations occurring in the cylinder strictly from the mechanical process in the cylinder alone okay does that make sense to you so the peak is at top dead center of the compression stroke and of course we can use that as a running pressure reading uh, or if you're doing the cranking compression, of course, that should be the same as you would read on your mechanical pressure gauge. What's also interesting to note about this peak is that this represents the point where the piston has gotten as close as it's going to, to the combustion chamber, to top dead center. It is fixed. It is reliable. It is always going to be your TDC reference. So if you wanted to compare when the ignition is occurring, related to DDC or when an injector event is occurring related to the crankshaft timing or TDC. This point is always fixed, always reliable, always TDC. Uh, now let's just take a look at how that would apply. I'm going to come back and I'm going to add channel two, which was our ignition trigger. Uh, this was off the igniter for the uh, Toyota's number one coil on plug ignition coil. And then I'm going to take a cursor and I'm going to move that over to that peak okay this is when the ignition the spark event occurred the spark fired it did it outside the cylinder but we still have a record when it fired for this cylinder now you notice it's occurring just before top dead center isn't that when it's supposed to occur if I want to take it one step further I can take the second cursor and place it right at the peak and measure the time in this case about four milliseconds now I'm going to take one cursor and I'm going to place it on the other peak okay that's a total of about hundred and sixty milliseconds you can do the math figure out the percentages do it however you want you want to do it but if you mentioned right, uh, what I said earlier peak to peak is 720 degrees of crankshaft rotation if that took 160 milliseconds then 4 milliseconds the time that we just measured from our ignition trigger to the uh, pressure peak of 4 milliseconds would represent about 18 degrees so we have an actual ignition timing actual ignition event occurring 18 degrees before top dead center on the compression stroke can I compare that to specification of course I can here's another example of where this comes into play anyone ever seen a sheared keyway for a crankshaft pulley so that the pulley was able to shift in relation to the crankshaft away from where it's supposed to be wouldn't that keep the cam and crank sensor signals in sync though that that relationship hasn't changed and isn't that what the ignition event is based on so if I saw the peak here way to the left or right of where it is now doesn't that indicate a problem something is affecting spark timing something that I need to investigate and find out what what the cause is maybe a shear key maybe a timing belt or a cam chain or a cam out of time not sure exactly but it's a very quick way to see if something's not the way it should be again this TDC peak is always TDC for real that's not going to change okay let's take a look at uh, something else we can do with the cursors again I've got this measured from peak to peak 720 degrees comes in at about 160 milliseconds we're going to use that for a nice round number now in order to understand what's going on here this is again 720 degrees of rotation the full four cycles compression 
power, exhaust, intake, and compression again of a four-stroke engine, correct? Well, if I want to see exactly where those TDC and BDC, top dead center and bottom dead center components are, can't I take that 160 milliseconds and divide it into quarters? Sure. So 160 divided into quarters, that's 40 milliseconds. If I take these two cursors now and place them 40 milliseconds apart, now my second cursor, the one that has the, the, the mouse on it, is representing bottom dead center of what? The power stroke, correct? And what occurs near bottom dead center of the power stroke? The exhaust valve opens. And that's what you're seeing. This pressure change here is where the exhaust valve is opened. And instead of a vacuum, we're now taking air from inside the exhaust chamber and drawing it in to balance out the pressures within the cylinder. Okay, next step on, 40 times uh, 2 would be 80. We're going to bring this over now about 80 milliseconds. This is now top dead center of what? The intake, excuse me, the exhaust stroke. The exhaust stroke. I got a little confused there because at the top dead center of the exhaust stroke, what happens? The intake valve is opened at the same time the exhaust valve is, doesn't it? It's an overlap period. But you can still see right here where the intake valve is starting to open and the ramp following it shows now the intake valve is indeed open. So all that manifold vacuum is now being drawn into the cylinder. Because the piston is moving from what? TDC to bottom dead center. So it's drawing in that next air, uh, air charge. So let's take it now with three times 40, 120. And we'll place that about here. It's a little off right about there. Okay, now we're at bottom dead center of what? The intake stroke. Shortly after we reach bottom dead center, the intake valve is going to close. You can see that right here. The cylinder sealed and then starts moving finally back up to where we started at the beginning of the compression stroke. So you can get an idea of what's going on, you know, using the cursors. I've often taken with my PicoScope uh, the screen capture and then uploaded the capture into Windows Paint and used the Paint program to actually lay out these four markers so I could see it more clearly. This particular platform though has a nice feature. Let me show that to you. Bring that back up. And uh, we have to, this is another capture from the same Toyota. We're going to do the same thing we did. I'm going to zoom it into where we can see it nice and pretty on just one cycle. Now, if your scope doesn't have the ability to zoom in like, like we're doing here, then you just need to adjust the time base until the pattern on your screen looks similar to the one that you're seeing here. Now, as I mentioned, it helps to have some idea of where in terms of crankshaft rotation these different events are occurring. I showed you how to do it with the cursors. And I explained that you can also do it in Windows Paint. What's nice here is that I can take this particular tool's um, cursors and I can move them over. One on each peak. Now, let me oh, come here, grab that. And then click this more camshaft, give it a second, and it will populate for me. It will set up the crankshaft for the degrees for me. Each of these is 180 degrees, and then all of these along the bottom are 30 degrees apart. So now we can really have a good reference to use as we're analyzing the diagram. Now, what are immediately some things that come to mind? I remember we used to suspect if there was a problem with you know, low power complaints, uh, we would do a compression test, maybe the pressure was good, and then we start looking at maybe cam timing. And we'd have to start disassembling 
parts of the engine in order to access the timing marks to verify it was okay. Well, if I can see when the exhaust and the intake are opening and closing, can't I tell from this diagram if those cams are in time? Absolutely. Let's just kind of zoom in for one moment. We'll come back in on just the exhaust side. See the upward ramp here? And see how this bottom dead center line intersects it? Not quite at the halfway point. Generally speaking, if I have this line intersecting the exhaust ramp anywhere from about here to about here, the exhaust is in time. Now, how many teeth is it going to be? How many degrees would it be if the, the, the timing belt was a tooth off? 10, 15 degrees? Well, we said these are 30 degree markings, so we'd actually see this ramp shifted over one side or the other, you know, maybe somewhere in the halfway point. So it'd be a significant difference. It's something you would be able to see pretty easily. All right, let me go back to the main pattern. Let's see if we can get that, get that back. We'll start from scratch again. And pardon me if I seem to flutter a little bit. Uh, I'm still fairly new to this particular platform, still kind of learning it. So if I'm not uh, as smooth as maybe I should be, it's just like any other tool. There's a learning curve. It's, uh, it's very easy on this one. And we'll go back and mark the camshaft again. And you can see they have the same thing here on the intake. Now, because we have an overlap period, the actual opening of the intake valve may not, may not always be easily distinguished. But this ramp is always going to be there. Once the exhaust valve closes, the intake valve is open. Okay, now we have the ramp as the cylinder draws into vacuum. And this is going to occur, again, shortly after TDC. Now on this particular scope, there's a, a during the analysis phase, there is a built-in live reading that, that will tell you in greens, yellows, and reds, you know, where your exhaust, exhaust and intake cam timing is. And that's based on general specs, but it, it gives you something. It takes you something to see and points out a potential problem. Now let's take another look here at some other features of this diagram. First, notice here's the peak. If we come down about halfway, you see how much pressure increase there is in just this halfway point in this peak? And that's only about, what, 30 degrees of crankshaft rotation. So it's interesting to note that most of the compression pressure built up in that cylinder is occurring in only 30 degrees of crankshaft rotation. Now what do you think would happen if there's something in here causing a leak, a loss of compression? Because what we're doing is we're starting off with X amount of air in the cylinder and then we bring the piston up and based on those old laws of physics as we close that space that that same amount of air is trying to take up, pressure is going to increase and as a side note so is temperature. So the pressure is increasing as we're squeezing that amount shut. Now if there's not as much in there after we get to the top because it's leaked out somewhere, won't we see a difference here in the way the pressure changes coming back down? Yes, you sure will. And what you'll see is instead of this being uh, symmetrical in shape, it'll become asymmetrical. It almost looks as if this tower is leaning to one side or to the right side, if you will, if there is a mechanical loss of compression. The other area that you'll notice here is what's called the exhaust pocket, this area right here. This should be relatively the same as the intake pocket over on this side of, the, of this uh, pattern. If there's a mechanical loss, this will drop lower. The reason being is that we have less air when we finish than what we started with. And there's more of a vacuum created. Okay. Um, next point, as we're coming down on the power stroke, 
you'll notice here, here's a nice round, smooth transition as we near uh, bottom to the center, and then all of a sudden there's a noticeable shift. See, we can zoom that in so you can see it. Well, again, getting used to the tool. See this noticeable shift here? That's definitely where the exhaust valve opened. If there's a problem with how the exhaust valve is opening, we have a worn cam lobe or a broken valve spring or something of that line, you'll see the difference here. Uh, let's see if I can turn. And we'll bring that back out this way and cheat a little bit so we can keep the pattern going. Okay, here's the exhaust plateau. Now the exhaust valve is uh, still open, right? Because now we're coming up on the uh, exhaust stroke. So the exhaust valve is open. This is the pressure balanced now between the open exhaust valve and the exhaust or exhaust back pressure. Using the snap throttle technique, you can actually identify restricted exhausts using this portion of the pattern. Okay, now we're here at top dead center of the exhaust stroke. Intake valve is open at the same time. Just past TDC, of course, we see the intake valve is now closing or open, excuse me, open, exhaust valve is closed. We have the ramp there for the intake. Intake valve is remaining open as we near BDC, bottom dead center of the uh, intake stroke. Again, this pattern here, the, the, the ripples you see here, this is going to be the indication when you have a problem with the intake valve not working as it should. And this is a static pattern that you're looking at on the screen. It's also helpful to watch this with the engine running to catch intermittent issues. An intermittent valve seal can occur uh, because of carbon buildup, for example. And as the valve rotates, it may seal just fine, but then it rotates to the point where the leak is most evident and you'll see the change, not just in the peak pressure, but in the way this pattern looks. Now, there's even more that you can learn from this, but like with any other procedure, the best way to learn is to use this technique on cars that you know are good, that you know don't have a problem. And then when you do have one with a problem, try this technique, compare what you've learned so far to what you now have on the bad car. And there are lots of resources available for you to continue learning this diagnostic process, but I think you've seen that we can get a lot of information about what's happening in that cylinder in a very short amount of time using in-cylinder pressure transducers. The scope and transducers that I used in today's edition of the trainer come from the folks at Automotive Test Solutions. Co-founder Bernie Thompson is a name that you'll likely recognize if you're a professional in this business and have been for any length of time. Um, he's also a noted instructor. He's probably one of the leaders in using in-cylinder pressure testing as a diagnostic tool, and he makes a lot of resources available to you at his website. If you ha need any more information or you want to learn more about the e-scope or in-cylinder pressure testing or any of the other fine products made by ATS, log on to www.atsnm.com. Well, that's all the time that we have for this edition of The Trainer. I sure appreciate you taking the time to watch, and I'll see you next month.